day can seem to have no beginning and no ending. It becomes a 25-hour day that blends into the one that came before and the one that is to follow. is a reasonable man, a man with a purpose. The range of his understanding of his purpose reaches far beyond his line of sight. He knows the big picture. He understands that attempts to intimidate by force must be resisted by force before intimidation becomes a way of international life. And this he also knows. He and the thousands like him, fighting and sweating on the ground, are the spearheads of our Department of Defense total effort, an effort concentrated to help the men on the ground to achieve their purpose and their mission. Above field and jungle, close air support. Help clear the way for the man on the ground. Reinforcing. Support those men during the long hours of daylight and the longer hours of darkness. Support them with B-52s against concentrations of troops and supplies. Give the enemy no chance to rest. Support them with tactical fighter bombers to keep up the pressure and help destroy our enemy's ability and desire to attack. With hundreds of thousands of tons by airlift, the supplies come through. But there are other lines of supplies that flow the other way along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It winds down from the north through mountain passes and under the cover of green top jungles. Along the flank of southern Asia, the coastline of North and South Vietnam takes the form of an elongated S, a demilitarized zone between the two countries along the 17th parallel at the sea was established by solemn treaty. To the north is China. To the west are Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, India, and Pakistan. Moving down from the north, men, oil, machines, the tools of war are fed along the Ho Chi Minh Trail to bolster the aggression in the south. They move by night over the narrow roads, through mountain passes, and along trails hidden by the jungle foliage. Trucks and pack-laden coolies by the tens of thousands. Usually, by day, they remain hidden in the jungle to venture out again at nightfall. That lifeline must be severed. When it is repaired, as it always is, it must be severed again. Every gallon of fuel, every gun, bullet, even every ration of rice destroyed north of the 17th parallel may mean the life of a man on the ground south of the 17th. The military call it interdiction. That is the mission of those who fly to the north. Support the men on the ground by strangling the supply routes. Pilots have always been fighting men. 
but to courage and daring. Today, you have to add the great technical skill and self-discipline demanded by their sophisticated weapons. But weapons no more effective than the men who fly them or those who keep them flying. Case in point, combat aircraft are maintained with a dedication that results in flying hours at a rate three times normal usage. The line crews understand how much depends on them day after 25 hour day. the spare is a very decent fellow but now he's been through the hours of pre-flight details he can't help but hope that one of the other aircraft will show up with a minor hydraulic leak or a cut tire sometimes that happens but not today supersonic blasts of power in the open ocean of the air, ready to play their part in the overall coordinated effort. There are other flights in the sky. The F-4Cs are en route. At the same moment in time, the big choppers, affectionately known as the Jolly Greens, are on their way with A-1Es for their protective escort. Their object is to stay as close as possible to the target area, so that if a pilot in one of the attack planes has to hit the parachute, then they can move in to pick him up. If there's enemy ground fire, those A-1Es dive in to keep the enemy's heads down. in the KC-135 tankers have been waiting to refuel the tactical fighter bombers en route to their targets. Those KC-135s will keep orbiting in case any of the boys run short of fuel on the way home. Most people will ask pilots the same question over and over. Aren't you scared? The answer is always pretty much the same. Sure we're scared until we button down the hatch. We're a one-man sort of operation. We're our own navigator, radio man, radar operator, and bombardier. Getting into the target, we have to take evasive action. Then it's pop up, dive in, drop the bombs, and get the heck out of there. You watch your fuel. You go over in your mind what the intelligence boys will want to know about the results. At the target, the ground defenses, all the details. You might be scared when you start, but after that, you just don't have the time. Results, positive. The cockpit is a pilot's office. Management of that office must be as precise and efficient as the complex instruments with which it is equipped. One flight of many flights. And there isn't a combat pilot who doesn't know it. Every bullet, every gallon of oil, every mortar stopped north of that 17th parallel can mean the life of one man, 10 men, 100 men, south of that parallel.
Roger from coming in from the uh, southeast. I have you in sight now. Uh, I'm just up to make it to 3 o'clock, Sunday night. Military action in Vietnam, a squadron of fighter aircraft has been called on for close support of a Marine company held up by punishing enemy fire from an abandoned village. Guided by the small observation plane close above the green battlefields of Vietnam, the Marine airstrike dives on target. has been broken by the precise application of air power, a vital part of this unusual war in which the political, economic, and psychological factors demand as much consideration as the military. Now the men of Lima Company, 1st Marines, are able to move forward because of the skillful use of an aircraft superbly adapted to supporting the riflemen in ground combat, the F-4B all-weather fighter, the Phantom. Empty racks, show hundreds of pounds of destruction have been delivered to the enemy. Now, Condal 83 heads for home. This is the flight leader, Lieutenant Colonel A.W. O'Donnell. The flight is part of Marine Squadron BMFA 323. Colonel O'Donnell is the skipper. Da Nang, 323's home port, is a main American base. Every day, this center for tactical air support launches and retrieves hundreds of combat sorties. Two powerful jet engines with afterburners and get the fully loaded 110 airborne at less than 3,000 feet. Completed tests in the tactical environments have proved the F-110 to be completely compatible with the entire arsenal of present tactical nuclear and non-nuclear weapons. Holder of more than a dozen world speed and time to climb records, the aircraft has flown in excess of 1,600 miles per hour and climbed to 65,000 feet in less than three minutes. The 110 is air refuelable and has both a nuclear and non-nuclear capability. Extremely versatile, it can deliver large composite loads of napalm, rockets, and conventional bombs. The 110 has the capacity to deliver more than twice the normal bomb load of the World War II flying fortress. Shown here is the delivery of a partial load composed of 13 750-pound demolition bombs. The versatility of the command's first-line fighters is demonstrated in the following sequences as the wide variety of missions assigned to TAC unfold. The F-100 makes a four-can napalm drop against enemy positions, tanks, or both. 2.75 rockets are fired against transportation facilities and convoys. In performing air-to-ground missions of interdiction and close air support, strafing runs are made with four 20-millimeter cannons. Dive bombing sorties are flown against road networks, troop concentrations, and supply areas.
highly important, the Super Sabre can deliver the GAM-83 Bullpup, the latest tactical air-to-surface missile. Fired from approximately 18,000 feet out, the Bullpup is guided to its target by the pilot, who visually superimposes on the target the flare in the rear of the missile. And he makes up, down, right, or left corrections from the cockpit until the bullpup strikes the target. Such simplicity in guidance is producing greater accuracy and reliability than has ever been experienced in air-to-surface missiles. The F-104, another of the Century Series fighters in the TAC inventory. The Starfighter can strafe enemy positions with its Vulcan 20mm cannon, capable of firing 6,000 rounds per minute. Napalm, a part of the 104 weapon inventory, is used against enemy concentrations and similar targets. In the air superiority role, the F-104 employs the GAR-8 Sidewinder against enemy aircraft. Here, a previously launched 5-inch high-velocity rocket is overtaken and destroyed by the heat-seeking GAR-8. The F-105, a one-man airplane capable of Mach 2 speeds, can carry weapons internally and externally. This recently developed delivery technique has resulted in improved accuracy. The delay between drop and detonation provides a safe escape time for the aircraft and pilot. The 105 also delivers its punch on enemy targets by dive bombing. with the M61 20 millimeter cannon, which pours 100 rounds into the target every second. Napalm is also a part of the 105's weapon arsenal. Against reinforced bunkers and concentrations of armor, the 105 uses 2.75 rockets to maximum advantage. For air-to-air -air combat, the F-105 uses the GAR-8 Sidewinder to ensure air superiority over the battlefield. Here, a direct hit is scored on a Mach 2 target drone. Back at Da Nang, the aircraft of Condol 83 become geared to a fast-moving ground operation. They've got to be ready for the next mission whenever it comes. Flight crews go in for debriefing. And the squadron skipper inspects the aircraft. Yeah, no, number two is hit. We believe it was on the first run. We thought he felt something. Uh, one hole in the uh, left portion of the stabilator. Three gun positions shooting. Looked like an uh, automatic weapon, 12.7 uh, millimeter. Was there any pattern to it? They were all shooting at the same time. Uh, Reasonably accurate fire on the first run. Uh, three pulled up. Refueling and, uh, and repair are completed quickly. The Phantoms are soon back to mission readiness. It's usually 95 degrees plus on the Da Nang flight line, but their mechanics are doing as good a job as they know how, and they're all experts.
On the empty racks of the F-4Bs go deadly air-to-ground missiles, pods of rockets, the thousand pounders they call iron bombs. When these aircraft go out, they'll be carrying a full load of trouble for the Viet Cong. On constant alert for maintenance and repair, the mechanics at Da Nang eat and sleep on the flight line. They're currently working some 14 hours a day, and they even do a little moonlighting on the side. The extra job, reinforcing the nighttime guard for the aircraft they service by day. Around the broad perimeter of the airfield, they mount posts and roving patrols against infiltrating Get Con. Williams Air Force Base, Arizona. I figure I'll, I'll arrive there and I'll, I'll be real quiet and calm and all that and I'll go in and all the students will nudge each other and when they meet me and I'll be their instructor and they'll fly with me and they'll nudge each other and say, what did Lieutenant Rasmus do before he came here? And I'll, you know, it'll be all quiet and no one will know until finally there'll be graduation and we'll show up in, their, in mess dress and there I'll be with my air medals and my DFCs and my silver star and my commendation what? medal and my Vietnam service medal and all this stuff all the way across and I'll walk in with a slight limp and they'll, they'll say tell me about it and I'll oh, say it was, oh it was nothing it was nothing <laughs> you know but then for a week after every time I crawl in the airplane as I get in I'll pull my leg in and I'll wince a little and I'll say what is it and I'll say oh it's just an old war injury <laughs> 45 44 right 45 44 14 How'd the mission go? Pretty good? Yeah, real good. Get another one. How many is that? Well, it's 42, 43 now. Okay. Major height. One mission, one counter, one for the month. We finally made the board. 99 hard ones to go. Oh, I'll get 43 this afternoon. I've got to put them off my hand for number 90. I've already got them. So you're going to get two today, huh? Yep. One more and I'll be able to make it bigger. More you'll be able to go red. He's been here about six months. It averages about six months for the tour. This wing, uh, even though we're roughly 100 miles from any sort of civilization, morale is high here. I've noticed that. The men know what they're doing and why they're here. Well, if they really still have to be over here, I'll come right back and the way you never me. You come right back and do another hitch. You bet I will. Well, I feel we have a reason to be here. As you read uh, Thomas Aggression in Asia, I feel that we didn't do, take some measures to stop it here. We may be fighting in our backyards. Enjoy some of the things that I've been over here for, such as just the American way of life. I served in World War II in the Southwest Pacific. Served during Korea. Yes, uh, I personally tried to discourage it. I ended up putting uh, 100 missions over North Vietnam to go home, get a rest, and then come back. However, I have uh, one pilot here that just insisted on uh, taking another 100. And he's here. His name is uh, Lieutenant Richter. Yeah, I want to come back down. How come you get to stay here? <laughs> Hey, you worked harder. You could have stayed here with me. Yeah, Mommy wouldn't have had any part to do with that. Yeah, okay, there's there's the deal, you know. You're, the flying's good. You don't have all the little nitpicking rules and regulations that you have to put up with in the States. At least we didn't two months ago. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's still a lot better than it is back there now. But I just, you know, I enjoy it. And then, uh, in the, 
it's the kind of deal like everybody says, yeah, I'm waving a flag, but I'm not. But at the same time, you know, where are you going to, uh, where are you going to stop it at, you know? Where's, where's Kami? Is he going to wait her in, uh, the Philippines or in Australia or San Francisco or Des Moines, Iowa, you know? You should stop sure. it here or wait till somewhere later on. I don't think most of the people think about that. They like me, you know, what, what happens, you know? If, uh, if I get shot down, uh, to me, they never get me anyway. Okay, gents, the mission this afternoon is I quote their support and support of Double Eagle. Call sign Condole 56-1, 2, 3, and 4. Crew is in order. O'Donnell and Kelly, Norad and Lassure, Heinzling and Johnson. Aircraft numbers 1, 6, 9, and 10. Let's go through the loading again. Bird numbers 1 and 6 are loaded with 6 napalm, each bird plus 2 or 1 Mark IV gun pod each airplane. The last two birds, 9 and 10, are loaded with uh, 12 250 pounders plus 4 2.75 19 shot pods on each aircraft. Okay, stand by for a time hack. Coming up on 1304. Hack. Okay, we got one minute to move out. Our bombing objectives, I believe, can be very distinctly divided into two phases. Our interdiction program conducted in the southern portion of North Vietnam in an attempt to deny movement of the enemy into South Vietnam, and our strategic, if you will, objectives in the northern portion of North Vietnam in terms of attacking principal lines of communications, the Northeast and the Northwest railroads, which comprise the two most major railroads in North Vietnam, also POL installations and other military supply and storage areas located in the delta regions of North Vietnam. This flight line at night is a pretty active place. There's more work done at night, actually, than there is in the daytime, because uh, the daytime is, is uh, completely taken off with uh, launching and recovering airplanes. I don't have much time for anything else. Of course, there's a turnaround. There's a lot of, of bomb loading uh, for the second go on, around noon, but nothing like uh, at night. You know, put it on one airplane, it doesn't come in commission, they have to take it off and put it on another one. It's pretty frustrating. They get it done somehow. I don't know how, but they do. They, we have a, a remarkable uh, uh, delivery rate here. I can't remember the last time I got a maintenance, non-delivery. We we'll always get an airplane. They do a real bang-up job, matter of fact. Mars target is the Yen Ben Railroad. It's the largest railroad in all of North Vietnam. Its function is to control all the traffic coming in from the North East Railroad and the North West Railroad into Hanoi. It then controls all traffic going south. It's located five nautical miles north of Hanoi. Its defenses include a heavy concentration of AAA and there are 26 known SAM sites in the area. Roscoe is brought here by a pilot from Kadena, who is temporarily assigned to the wing. When the pilot was shot down up north, Roscoe sort of became everybody's dog, the only dog allowed on base. Now Roscoe's a free agent and goes everywhere, sort of a, a tramp with a big heart. But lots of guys, for instance, don't feel right unless he's sitting there in a commander's chair during the mission briefing. They say if he sleeps, it's going to be an easy mission. If his ears perk up, watch out. We hear an awful lot about surface-to-air missiles. They're called SAMs, or referred to as SA-2s. This is a picture of an SA-2 site situated in the immediate Hanoi area. A close-up of this particular target would look something like this. Very clearly, you can observe the presence of SA-2 missiles. And in this area, we find the radar van which controls the firing of the missiles and also tracks the aircraft along with providing guidance to the SA-2 missile. Our pilots are constantly faced in flying into North Vietnam with missile firings along with extremely heavy 
anti-aircraft. I kind of call it the dry throat mission myself. Usually I come outbound from the target and I'm just kind of sucking that water bottle dry, dry throat. <laughs> it's about as, as scary a mission as I've ever been on. Uh, I think it tries you to just about the maximum on uh, the missions. If you can get between uh, a ridge between you and that radar site, they can't guide a missile at you. It's just when you get down in the delta in the flatlands, that 30 mile ring around uh, the city of Hanoi is is a bear because it's flat you have no protection and uh, i don't know how true it is but they say it's the most heavily defended place in the uh, history of aerial warfare i've been there and i believe it the winds there from the surface to five thousand feet along the coast are going to run about 25 knots out of the northeast did have an aircraft report right over the mountain areas there this morning just about a Magia Pass at 5,000 feet, he had a wind of 030 at 40 knots. Everybody wear your black belt today, guys. Doesn't have one. Drop black. Well, that wards it off. Everybody wear your flak magnets. How come no matter how much in a rush, I'm always the last guy? You don't want to go. I mean, <laughs> show some kind of reluctance. There ain't no way, huh? There ain't no way. You got those flags you're gonna tie between the wings? Or one on each wing? Yes, sir. I always have to quit, quit washing the morning. Now, first of all, we have in our vest is the radio, which is the most important item we have. Our second item, I would say, is the flares. The third is your weapon. They have their compass and the mirror for singling. And find direction. The most important one upon bailout is the beeper. I hear yours too. How many bombs are carrying? Yeah. Who did that? How many bombs we got? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We must have 20 more. Well, 30 bombs, haven't we? belongs to this one? 148. That's mine. 148. Uh, don't kick my first out. Okay, now we'll
The airplane's working all right. You got to the tanker. And, uh, it accepted the gas. That means you're going. That's, that's your last chance. After everybody gets full, you extend. And you head up to your drop-off point.
Mr. Magoo. There are three of them. They're shooting at us, too. All right. So, oh, there's another one out of the way. Yeah, another one, that's right. Yes, indeed. It's 51. 51 now. Kind of look at that. We've been very successful here in taking uh, pilots from SAC, ADC, uh, Training Command, and as long as they go through one of the tactical schools, and uh, one of the 105 schools to attack Air Command, back in the States and receive uh, roughly 70 hours in the 105, they do a good job here. We do have a few youngsters right out of the training school, but most of uh, our pilots have been in the Air Force 10 to 12 years or longer. And in fact, we have some grandfathers here that uh, My best day uh, was uh, the 5th of July when uh, I attacked and destroyed uh, four SAM sites in one 25-minute mission. And this came about because uh, in uh, escorting the strike flights, Two SAM sites came up on our way in. We had to uh, attack these boys to turn them off the air to get into the target area. While in the target area, another SAM site came up threatening to strike force. And of course, we attacked and got him. And then on the way back out, another SAM site came up to block our exit out of the target area, which was about 15 or 20 miles north of Hanoi. And uh, we only had one pot of rockets and uh, 20 millimeter cannon ammunition remaining, but he fired two SAMs at us and we managed to acquire him visually and put the rockets on him and machine gun him out of commission. This was the best day I've had and I don't care to go through another one of those. <laughs> A little too much for an old man. So if I could, if I can swing a deal to get down south with uh working 100s or F5s or A1s or, geez, I don't care, as long as it's uh, close air support. If I can swing that, I'm gonna just try to go, or maybe back to the States, TDY to upgrade and down there. If not, I'll stick around and fly an O1 or an A1. I'd check you out right up north, you know. Did you ever have thoughts uh, that you might not make down here? Oh, no. Yeah, but, uh, uh... I've been drawing paper 16 years. Uh, this is my job. <laughs> well, honest to God, you know, you get up in the 90s and you got 10 to go and you say, well, I'm going home pretty soon, so I've got to tell these guys something. So you go lay in bed at night and you think of things to tell them. And a run sled. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute, let him finish. I'm going to tell you guys something right now. This is my speech, and I don't need any help. Uh, incidentally, I have a three-hour speech prepared. Forget it. <laughs> Something I'm damn proud to have, besides working with all you guys and with your names here, I don't really need this picture frame with it. <laughs> but, uh... No, I remember you, because those are the guys you remember, the guys you fought with.